Good morning, everyone, and a happy July the 12th, the sixth Sunday after the day of Pentecost. God bless you. I'm so glad that you can be with us to the St. Mary's family out there, as well as all of our friends who are out there all over the place and are joining together for worship this morning. Um, God bless you all. I hope you're well. Um, I hope you're hanging in there. I hope you are finding grace bit by bit in this beautiful life we share together. I have a couple of announcements. First, um, this afternoon we will be having our first in-person outdoor worship service. It's at 5 o'clock and we are restricted to 50 people um, at this gathering. I am aware of folks who tried to register but it was already full. I'm aware there are folks out there who would like to have come but aren't able to. Um, I am glad to hear from anybody who wanted to come but wasn't able to. Um, we'll, we are working on ways to answer that need among us. Um, so um, please stay tuned for that. Um, we will have, as long, God willing, a five o'clock in-person outdoor worship service for 50 folks each Sunday afternoon, beginning uh, this afternoon. Couple of another, uh, couple of other announcements. First, a new uh, book group is forming. They will be meeting as usual through a Zoom call, and they'll be reading Henry Nouwen's beautiful book, The Return of the Prodigal. 
Um, and you can be in touch with Amelia McDaniel um, if you'd like to sign up for that. Also, Children's July packets um, are still available and you can arrange to get one of those for your children by in, being in touch with Amelia as well. Um, if you are watching this um, and do not receive regular weekly newsletters from St. Mary's Church, um, you can simply go to our website, which is St. Mary's at um, uh, St. Mary's at Goochland, uh, St. Mary's Episcopal Church at Goochland, and sign up to be to receive our weekly um, newsletter. God bless you all. God love you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethal the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban the Armorian. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer 
and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading of the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. They sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Word of the Lord. I've been thinking about something so much lately. I'm thinking about how we aren't able to tell the story of this life that we are right in the middle of now. Of course we can't. We are too much right in the middle of it. But I do wonder Are we in the middle of what will be an inspiring story for the next generations, a story of strength and resilience and survival and making our way somehow to the other side of this with at least most of our humanity intact? Are we in the middle of a story about coming to grips with the age-old sin of slavery and the long, long shadow it has cast, our unfinished business as a nation, and the dawning beginning again of a new healing for this ancient wound? Are we in the middle of a story about our journey through the wilderness, a journey that ends up tempering us and humbling us so that when we get to the end of it, we will learn to treasure what matters to us most and cast aside things which we have come to realize we were foolish to cling to for so long. Or are we in the middle of a story how too many things went wrong one after another that we just couldn't overcome and that we ended up landing in a worse spot than when we had started this all? How does this story end that we're in? Not with a bang, but a whimper? as T.S. Eliot wonders in his great poem, The Hollow Men, or will it end with Alleluia's? I don't think we know yet. We don't know what kind of a story we're in yet. What I can say for sure is that we are in the can't see the forest for the trees part of this story. I wish, I wish, I wish I could step back and catch a glimpse of the big picture now. 
I wish we could, but we don't seem able to do that now. We seem to just be reacting to one single tree after another and having to be right about that one single tree and missing the whole forest. I wish we had even a tiny bit of the big picture, some perspective. All of this reminds me of a story that I heard years ago about getting out of the trees and seeing the forest. It seems that there once was a very talented, young, gifted, faithful Roman Catholic priest, and he was in his mid-twenties and had just been assigned by the bishop to serve as the pastor of a large, prestigious urban parish. People were beginning to say that the bishop was grooming him for bigger and bigger things. Well, the young priest heard all this, and he was smart enough to know that he needed to talk about it with his old mentor, a much older retired priest. When they met the retired priest and he talked about this and that, the old priest gave him his hearty congratulations and blessings. Eventually, the young priest said to his mentor, you know, it's not unusual for the pastor of this parish that I'm now to serve, and in pretty short order, to be made a monsignor. The parish would expect it, and after all, the past five pastors of this parish have been accorded that same honor. The older priest said, yes, yes, I think you're right. The young priest said, yes, so it could be that I will be made a monsignor before reaching the age of 30. The old man looked at his young friend and said, yes, quite possibly. And then what? The young priest said, well, for those who are made monsignor at such a young age, it only makes sense, of course, God willing, that I might be made a bishop. Ah, the old priest said, yes, a bishop. Well, that makes sense. And then what? Well, the young man said, of course, many things can happen, but as a young bishop, it might be that I would have gained enough experience, even at a relatively young age, and would be made archbishop. An archbishop, the old man said, yes, great office and responsibility. And then what? Well, it could be, the young priest said, that having served so long in positions of authority that, God willing, I would be made a cardinal of the church. The old priest said, yes, a prince of the church. Hard no. And then what? Well, the young man said, I would be about the right age, I'm told, and though it's much too much to think about, but, well, it could be that it would be time for someone such as me, and then perhaps I would become Pope. His old mentor said, ah, Pope, it could be. One never knows, Pope. And then what? The young man said, and then what? Yes, the old priest said, and then what? The old man is inviting his young friend, if he has ears to hear, to step back from the few trees of the life his friend has attached himself to. He is trying to teach him how to see the forest of the life and love of God. Which brings us to sit with our own great teacher and mentor, Jesus. 
The reading from Matthew's Gospel marks an abrupt change in the style of teaching for Jesus. Till now, his teaching has been clear and direct, like in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not so that you may not be judged. But today he begins to teach in parables, little stories about women making bread, farmers, fishermen casting nets. And the reason Jesus gives for doing this, for making this change, is the fact that many people and their leaders around Jesus have closed their ears and stopped listening to him. They would rather be blind and deaf than see and hear that the kingdom has drawn near to them in Jesus. They would rather be right about what they think about their own little worlds, their own few special trees, than face what is sitting right in front of them, right before their eyes. Sitting in a boat just offshore so that the large crowd that has gathered around him can see him as he speaks, he says, he begins by saying, listen. Listen. A sower went out to sow. The sower Jesus has in mind is someone with something like a halter over their shoulder with a fabric bag at the hip to reach into for handfuls of seed to toss. And we learn as Jesus tells this story that the sower doesn't have a particular plot of ground marked out for a garden with neat rows the way that we would. This sower just tosses hand fills every which way so that they land on hard packed paths which the birds spy out and swoop in and eat up and some under rocky ground where the thin soil is warmed up and jump starts germination but the soil is too thin for a root to go down deep so the seedlings are burned up in the hot sun and some fell among thorns and whatever grew there is lost and overgrown and might as well never have been planted at all and some even miracle of miracle actually falls on good soil producing bushels and bushels of grain. Jesus says, let anyone with ears listen. Jesus is showing us what kind of a story we are in, if we have ears to hear. With this parable, there is tremendous temptation to run in to defend and justify ourselves and our own few special trees, to squabble over what kind of soil we are, or, much more tempting, what kind of soil someone else is. But that misses hearing, I think, the kind of story Jesus shows us that we are in. And we miss seeing the forest of God's life and love because this story is not so much about us. It really isn't. It's about who God is and what God is like. God is like a woman kneading bread, like a fisherman casting a net. God is like a sower who went out to do sow some seed. Not like you or I would do, but as God does. And the seed is the life of Jesus buried in the soil of this world, this life dying and rising and bearing good fruit. The story we are in is and ever will be grounded in graciousness through the grace of the one who, like a sower, sowing and sowing the word of life and love of Jesus into this world. 
The story that we are in right now is to bear witness to that, that graciousness with our own lives. Receiving grace, we give grace. We live grace by grace. The story we are in right now has rocky ground and hard beaten paths and overgrown thorns we cannot deny, and even miracle of miracles, good soil. And God is like a sower, spreading the word of life and love over all of it. God is careless, thanks be, with the grace he gives to make this life gracious. Can't that be our story? To be gracious to. Amen. of the people. As the word goes forth from the mouth of God, let us turn our hearts to those in need and offer prayers for all peoples in every place. For Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops, for David and Eleanor, our priests, for this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place, Lord have mercy. For all nations, peoples, tribes, communities, and families, Lord have mercy. For mercy, peace, and justice in the world, Lord have mercy. For farmers and a good harvest, for those on vacation, and for safety from violent storms, Lord have mercy. For all who thirst and hunger, the sick and the dying, the poor and the oppressed, travelers and prisoners, and for their families, Lord have mercy. For those who rest in Christ, and for all those who have died, especially remembering William Wilson, Lord have mercy. For ourselves, our families, 
our companions, and all those we love. Lord, have mercy. In our outreach cycle of prayer, we pray for the work of Gateway Homes, for their staff, volunteer and healthcare providers who work to bring new health and opportunities for those suffering from mental health issues in our city. Lord, have mercy. Lifting our voices with all creation, with Mary, the Mother of God, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. Lord, have mercy. God, who sows seeds of faith, receive our prayers and give life to our mortal bodies through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray especially this day for our nation. O oh God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These and all our prayers we offer as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Go forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, hold fast that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>